here we are in number 15 of the Light at the End of the Tunnel series. Um, my name is Naomi Stead and I'm a professor and head of the Department of Architecture at Monash University. Um, and this series is a collaboration between Pilar and Monash Architecture. Um, as always, we begin with uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands upon which we are all located, of course, across across the whole nation today. Um, and on behalf of Palo, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country across Australia's many nations and recognise continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to elders past and present and to the Indigenous Australians who are part of the Palo community. Uh, as I said, this is the 15th in our series, Light at the End of the Tunnel, which looks into architecture broadly conceived. Uh, in fact, architecture conceived as a profession, a discipline and a practice and how it may be affected by the pandemic. This week, our guests are Rachel Bernstone and Sinea Norton, I'm very pleased to say, uh, and the topic is speaking up. Broadly speaking, uh, it's, a, it's a, um, a session about communication, which is, of course, very close to both Justine and my heart. Justine will introduce Sinea and Rachel in a moment, but first, as always, some protocols for the session. Please make sure your microphone is on mute. It's particularly important this time because this is a big one. Uh, but feel free to leave your camera on. We always invite people to do that because it, uh, it's a sense of community which we really value. The format is Q&A. It's meant to be informal but informative. Uh, Justine and I will ask questions um, throughout, but we'll also take questions from the floor, not just at the end, but during. So please, if you have a question, please put it into the chat function. Um, and then we select questions from the chat and ask people to pose that question live. So we'll come back to you um, ask you to put your um, camera and microphone on and pose your question. Please feel free to also add your own observations and experiences into the chat. We're very happy for you to, to reflect or comment or um, share your own experiences as a kind of parallel narrative to the questions. Um, it's likely we won't get to all of the questions, but they will help to inform the topics of subsequent sessions. And now I'm going to throw to Justine to introduce Sanea and Rachel. And Justine, take down the, the main slide. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to do that after, um, after I'd stopped talking, but here we go. Hello, everybody. Okay, so as Naomi said today, our topic is speaking up and we're exploring strategies for communicating with confidence and clarity at an individual level and at the level of the profession. So how can we tell compelling stories about our own work how can we articulate the value of architecture to wider audiences? And what are the particular pressures and opportunities that we face during the pandemic? So as Naomi said, we're joined by Sinea Norton and Rachel Bernstone to discuss all of this. And I think it's gonna be a fantastic conversation. They bring really complementary skills, expertise and experience. Um, so I think it will be, uh, you know, you know, we've got a lot of people out there and I think this is really one to come to. So, Sinea describes herself as a public servant turned entrepreneur. She's a landscape architect who had a long career at the New South Wales Government Architects Office and now has her own design communication firm, SNDC, uh, which aims to empower designers to become stronger communicators. Sinea was our uh, Instagram guest host last week and her wonderful combination of tips and personal stories was a huge hit. Um, a lot of work, I believe, um, but incredibly valuable. Rachel is a journalist and editor, a comms advisor to architects and a vocal advocate for good design. Her consulting agency, Sounds Like Design, advises practices on developing communication strategies that focus on winning new projects and communicating the value of architecture. Her writing and advocacy work focuses on promoting the value of architecture to a broader audience. She has a very strong commitment in particular to advocating for climate emergency targets and social and affordable housing. Um, she's not afraid to speak up and we really value her for that. <laughs> so welcome, Sanea and Rachel. Um, thank you for joining thank us. You. Um, it's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting us. As Naomi says, this is a topic that is close to both of our hearts as well. So I thought perhaps we might just start with the fundamentals. What are the absolute basics of good communication? I expect you could both speak for hours about that. But um, I wonder if you might, we might just get each of you to share sort of around three things that you think people should focus on, whether they're speaking about themselves, their work, or the profession as a whole. 
who wants to start? Sinead, are you happy to go first? Yeah, yeah, I'll go first. Right. Um, I loved this question because um, the first three workshops that I put out into the industry covered what I thought were the three fundamentals of good communication. So one is, is distill your message and it's know what you want to say first and make sure you can say it in a short way, like a short, concise way. That's one. The second one is think about who you're talking to. Um, who do you want to reach? What's your intention with this message? And then the third one is how are you going to deliver it? How are you going to say it? How are you going to write it? How are you going to communicate it? So the first thing is distill your message. Second one is think about your audience. And the third one is how are you going to say it? How are you going to deliver it? That was a masterclass in succinct <laughs> communication. <laughs> and recap at the end and everything. It was beautiful. <laughs> I've got to walk the talk. <laughs> yeah. Rachel. Uh, my, my three things are the same, but I have them in a slightly different order. <laughs> Uh, so mine is um, who are you speaking to? I think that it's important to um, work out your audience first because your message might be different depending on who you wish to deliver it to. Um, so for me, audience comes first, the who. Um, the second thing is the what, which is what Sanaya was talking about, distilling the message. So to me, that's absolutely paramount. And I think it's one of the things that architects have tended to not be so good at, but there's certainly a lot of room for improvement there. Um, architects tend to be generalists and they don't tend to hone in on one particular aspect or a, a distillation of their message and so we have very short attention spans now people are spending eight seconds looking at things as they're scrolling you need to be very succinct and Sanaya said that beautifully um, and the third thing is about distribution where are you going to distribute that message and depending on who your audience is you might go for different channels because uh, if you're looking to find clients, you might do that on social media. If you're looking to talk to stakeholders, that might be on LinkedIn. If you want to um, talk about an award that you just won, you might do that on your own website. So depending on who your audience is, you can tailor the distribution and the message uh, to hit the spot or to hit the target, if you like. Excellent. Now, can I ask my other question, which is relating to this, is what are some of the um, common mistakes that you see? What, the, what do people do that you think is probably stop them? Yes, um, one of the key things I think, um, that one of the key things that I've seen is you don't realise that not everybody is as interested in your topic as you are. So you... <laughs> You're passionate about something and you've got all this information that you've researched and work that you've done and you want to share it. But people have limited time and potentially not the same interest. So that's what I see. One common mistake. You talk for too long and in too much detail to somebody about your thing where maybe a better technique might be to give them a short snippet, give them an overview and see how they respond. If they're interested and they're going, oh, tell me more. Great. Continue. And if they're not, then just think about how much longer you talk about that topic or, you know, is this the right, the right audience? <laughs> um, can I say a couple of other things I see? Sure. A couple of other things I see are um, a lot of the time people get frustrated when somebody, an audience or a client uh, doesn't get their idea or doesn't get the project or their work or what they're trying to say. And then I would ask that person, have you said it? in enough ways and enough times for that person. We expect people to get something straight away. And then we think, oh, well, nobody understands architecture or nobody understands what I do. But have we actually put the effort in, in explaining it and educating? Yeah. Um, and then the third thing is quite an interesting one. Um, again, we might be passionate about a particular thing within design or architecture. It might be urban grain, for example, how important that is in a city. We might use that term, not realising it's jargon, or we might just keep saying how important it is without really going to that extra level of why. Why is it important? First of all, what is it? And then two, what does it bring to a city? Why is it important to me? Why is it important on projects? Just some examples of your key points of interest. We don't go quite far enough in explaining the why. Excellent. 
we're all thinking guiltily about when we've done those things. Um, of course, Rachel, me too. What, <laughs> what are your, um, what are the, the things that worry you that you see that people can um, move on? I'm concerned about architecture's um, tendency to talk amongst th themselves for architects to address um, their peers through their communications, um, especially through publication and awards entries. A lot of um, material tends to be written, as Sinead was saying, using a lot of jargon and archie speak, and that can be quite, um, it can be a way that other people who don't have design training or knowledge feel excluded. So it means that the message um, doesn't resonate beyond the profession. Um, so I think that it's really important, as Sinead was saying, to drill down a bit into what, um, what's important about the thing that you're trying to explain the why as she put it and to use plain language you know the the law profession had to go through a period about 20 years ago where they um, brought everything back to a level where regular people could understand it and i'd really like to see architects try and do that too with a lot of their communications and we see as well that um, that translates into architects talking a lot to their peers on instagram so i think that a lot of the outward facing communications that architects put out into the world as a way of um, talking about their practice or their work or promoting the value of architecture, it tends to be quite insular. And the images, um, they don't show the behind the scenes, they don't show the people who are involved in creating these amazing projects, they just show beautiful glossy images. And the images don't tell the full story. So then you have captions that accompany those and they're full of jargon. So they don't elucidate any further on the image either. And so you get this um, echo chamber effect where architects are great at talking to other architects, but they're not necessarily reaching a broader audience. So to me, that's a huge um, challenge, but it's also quite easy to overcome because all you need to do is um, change the way that you use words and describe your work and 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 you should try and address um, an audience as if they're novices one of the problems is that architects tend to be married to architects so they talk about architecture in a language that they understand but they don't often have an opportunity to bring it down to a more um, legible level for regular people so for me that's one of the big things that i try to do with my um, with my journalism i try and be a bridge between architects and people who are reading magazines for example that i'm writing for but also with the clients that i work with to try and get them to be um, more accessible to the public because i think that you know, we all understand the, the importance and the value of good design and that's only growing in importance as we deal with climate emergency and now with COVID. And people are interested and hungry and they have an appetite to know about it, but they can't find out about it if the profession isn't meeting them halfway. Very true. I mean, I haven't, I would, I, I think it's really important to have conversations of, you know, disciplinary conversations, but but those disciplinary conversations are different than the way you communicate. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I'd like to just add something on that, which is that I, I really, um, I don't like the phrase dumbing down. Mm -hmm. If anybody's concerned that making your work more accessible to more people involves dumbing down or making it basic, I don't think that's what it's about. I think it's inviting people in to the complexity of our profession and the detail and the terms even use them but just explain them i think your urban grain one is a is a very good example because it it's an idea that really matters but it only matters it it's only going to have an effect if people know what the hell you're talking about yes so what do you say to those people um who quite you know there's many of many people say oh my work speaks for myself or my work should speak for itself what what do you say to that I love this one <laughs> because it's so common. Uh, it, it's so common that it was a headline on a Habitus story this year where an architect was pictured standing in a, in a window frame looking out over Bondi Beach of an apartment that he developed and, he, and the headline was such and such an architect wants the work to speak for itself. And for me, this is one of my biggest bugbears because as Sinead just said, architecture is really complex. You know, architects are juggling all sorts of constraints and challenges and um, complexity. And, you know, that runs from council approvals to budgets, to heritage concerns, to environmental issues, 
Um, you know, there might be adaptive reuse, there might be the selection of materials. It's so complicated. And if you expect that a person can look at a beautiful image and understand all of that complexity and all of the work and the thinking and the juggling and the problem solving and the different collaborators who brought, you know, skills and expertise to developing that solution, if you think one image can convey that, either the person who's looking at the image is already aware of the complexity of architecture or they're just going to completely miss your meaning and your message. So Sanaya has said already beautifully that, you know, architects need to, um, to explain what they do, why it's valuable, why it's useful, give examples. And um, I think that the work should speak for itself might have been a useful maxim for talking about design communications 30 years ago. I, I don't think it was, but it might have been, but it's certainly not in today's world where people expect so much more from communications. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think a that's really that. interesting okay. observation from um, Sue Wittenoom in the in the chat. Um, Sue, do you want to? I guess it's an observation more than a question, but you, would you like to put that to the group? Well, just to say that 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 model of putting the design on a pencil um, and letting it be soaked up by the audience, um, old fashioned as it is, proving remarkably persistent, and I think self selected by people who either want to position themselves in that same global pantheon of people who who um, can afford to or who want to just rely on the images. So I just think it's a remarkably persistent. I, I don't like it either, but it's it's all about meditations on the ego at work. <laughs> Well, in fact, I think you're, you're absolutely right, Sue, but it speaks to the kind of dark side of the tightness of the architectural community. It seems to me that, you know, the architectural community is very tight and very clannish. Um, and I can speak from the academic context and say that we are also guilty of speaking to architects as well as speaking to academics, not necessarily speaking to the 16 year olds who might be considering enrolling in an architecture degree. So this is a problem um, even beyond the profession itself. But what I guess, Sue, another way of framing your question is around the kind of mythologies of architecture. And sometimes, sometimes deliberately, sometimes very cleverly, people play on those mythologies in their communications as well. I mean, what would you say about that, Sanaya and Rachel? Mm. I think there are many successful examples of being a, an obtuse, talented genius um, in, in the profession. There's, and I can imagine lots of young architects coming through the profession look at that and go, well, they've done it like that. Why, don't, why can't I? Um, so, I, I mean, I love thinking about it. There have been people in my workshops who completely disagree with the premise that architecture needs to be clear and clarified for a broader audience. They, they want to maintain the mystery. Um, so there's, there are a bunch of different perspectives. Um, one of the things I wanted to respond to from Sue is, I think you said something about the power of the image or the... Um, I like to get people that work with me to practice talking about their work with no images whatsoever. So the, the trap of my work speaks for itself implies that there's something physical there. There's a visual, there's a building already there. There's something I can show you that I've done. It'll speak for me. But what happens when either you don't have those visuals to hand or your work isn't built yet, or you're at some, you know, some amorphous phase with your work that is hard to communicate visually. And so you can't rely on your visuals. What then? Can you just use your words, your hands, your face to bring your idea to life for people? So when people say to me, my work speaks for itself, I normally just say, really? What's it saying? What's it saying now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Naomi, you, um, do you have anything else for me? Um, 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 We've talked a bit about audience and how um, architects might um, accidentally or deliberately speak just primarily to other architects into a kind of insular echo chamber, as Rachel has said. But how, if we speak very practically for a moment, how could, um, how should the communication approach for diff change depending on different audiences? Are we talking about vocabulary? Are we talking about tone? Are we talking about levels of formality? What are we talking about? Yeah, all of those things, I think. Um, which is why I think 
it's really important to um, determine your audience from the outset because um, if you're an architect working on residential projects and you're talking to um, people who might be thinking about building or designing a new house, the way that you're going to talk about your process and the outcomes and their involvement is very different to if you're talking to a procurement officer at a local government around you know, a new civic building because the procurement officer probably, probably has a better um, sense of familiarity with the process and understands all of the nuance and the complexity that's going to unfold over the course of that uh, project, whereas the residential uh, customers or clients might never have embarked on this process before and they might never again. So there's a great deal more education and information required uh, in that client relationship than with the the procurement officer who does this for a living. Uh, and then there's a whole different set of um, requirements, audience requirements, if you like, when you're talking to um, prospective customers or clients about your work. So the types of messaging that you might put on your website around what, what you do and what you offer and how people might start to engage you. And I think that one of the things that architects haven't um, really grappled with is that the nature of communications and the way that brands or organisations um, connect and engage with their audiences or with their potential customers has really shifted dramatically in the past 10 years with the advent of social media. So that it started to change with, um, with online, you know, with websites and email, let's say 20, 25 years ago. But in the past 10 years, it's sh the landscape shifted dramatically again. And now, uh, consumers can have a direct conversation and a dialogue with someone they want to buy something from on Instagram, you know, with the maker or with the, um, with the creative behind a particular product. So that sense of familiarity um, leads to what marketers now call this know, like and trust factor. So people buy from people that they feel connected to and architects haven't yet worked out, I don't think, um, how to create those types of engagements with people who might be potential customers or clients of their practice. And if you're working and only um, trying to secure projects from government, that's quite different. But if you're working in the public realm or in residential, it's useful to understand how that landscape has shifted and how you might uh, change your messaging to adapt to it. Mm. I wonder, can we just keep going on social media for a second? Because I think that's really important because um, it seems to me that the, it, it's exactly as you were saying before, Rachel, that um, if, you, if all you're putting, for example, on Instagram is glossy images of the finished building, then that, that, I guess that's a kind of like um, old model of advertising, like the kind of thing that you might have done in a magazine. But you can actually personalise and make more intimate and even break down professional barriers and be more... Um, have more personality on social media. Do you think that's a good idea? I think it's a great idea. And, and the reason that it's really important to establish those kinds of connections with people that might um, come into the orbit of your firm or want to um, use your services down the track is that people buy from people. And this is a really common sort of um, catchphrase that's being bandied around in marketing circles now, but it really speaks to this two-way dialogue that can exist between service providers or brands and their customers or clients. And um, th there are several ways that you can establish those relationships. You can, you can build them initially on social media just by inviting people to comment on your posts, by, by re returning the comment or asking them to DM you, you know, to direct message you um, through a back channel on those social media posts. You can do stories and people can send you comments that way. But then you really want these people to come closer into your network. So you want to invite them to come to your website where you can continue that dialogue dialogue and then you'd like them to um, subscribe to your email list because then you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them by landing in their inbox you know on a regular basis whether it's once a week like I do or once a month which is probably more achievable for an architecture firm but that personal um, dialogue I think architects have tended to shy away from revealing too much of themselves from you know it goes back to this issue of the work should speak for itself and I don't want to put myself in the frame but the fact that the landscape has shifted so dramatically um, 
architects are in danger of being left behind if they don't adapt their um, messaging to this new environment we find ourselves in. Mm. One thing that struck me lately with the um, arrival of Instagram stories, which I have to say I'm not very good at, is it, it seemed to me to start with with Instagram that we were seeing some practices certainly showing a lot of behind the scenes stuff and development and the nitty gritty of site. And I kind of really liked that. I thought that was a real strength that you could, um, some practices were doing that kind of work really well. And it feels to me with stories, now that happens all in stories, but the kind of main Instagram, it's all gone back to pretty, you know, beautifully composed pictures. Yes. And I kind of, I'm a bit sad about that. Maybe it's just because I'm not really good at stories, but I felt like there was a moment, there was a period there where some architects were doing a really good job of showing the kind of behind the scenes side of things because Instagram was quite informal. So. I don't know if you noticed that. Maybe it was just me, the people I was looking at. Um, there is a bit of a theory around Instagram that you should keep your feed clean and aesthetically pleasing and keep all that behind the scenes stuff to your stories. Yeah. So, so perhaps people have cottoned on to that a bit. I'm a bit sad about that, but then I'm someone who, who posts when I've got a flat tire. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, Justine, I wonder if we could go to a question from Diana Snape, a very good question about critique. Yes. Diana, do you want to put your question? Sure. Hi, everybody. Lovely to see you. Um, yeah, so my question is kind of a general one and comes from the fact that, you know, I'm working in government and in the design review space quite a lot. And I'm interested about how we use language of critique, how we describe the good and the bad. So it's not only talking about your own projects, but that of other people in a in a constructive way. And my question is, um, how do we make language about design quality more accessible? Because it seems to be a persistent issue. What does design quality mean and what is good design? Great question. Naya, do you want to? <laughs> yeah, I've got some things to say on this. I, I love this question. Hi, Di. Um, one of the things is, it's always better when the language of critique isn't personal. So take you and your idea and your design completely out of it. It's also really helpful if there are clear objectives from the start for that project and for the design. And so I believe effective critique comes when you're measuring what's been designed against a clear objective that was there from the start. And how effective is the, are those design decisions at meeting that objective? So that's, that's always the starting point for me, language of critique. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's one of the key things for me. I've had a, um, an observation around the way that architects tend to communicate generally, and I'm happy to be held down by people in the audience around this because it's a theory I've come up with completely on my own. It's around um, the way that critique and um, the commentary around design happens at university in studios. And my understanding is that that can be a quite combative um, atmosphere and environment and that people can, um, it, it can result in people feeling, as Sine was saying, quite um, personally attacked. And I've heard a lot of stories um, more from women than from men, but from both genders around, you know, how in first or second year, a particular tutor or lecturer reduce them to tears in a studio. And I think that that, um, that kind of conversation and communication then becomes quite um, persistent and embedded and it translates into the workplace as well. So the architects sometimes feel like people who are making, um, perhaps constructive criticism or asking questions about, well, I don't understand what you keep saying urban grain, what is urban grain? There's a tendency then to feel um, combative in your response and to be defensive. And so that shuts down um, any practical and useful constructive conversation that might grow out of those questions. And one of the things that I think that you can try and implement as a way of perhaps overcoming some of that defensiveness. And it comes from the questioner and from the person responding as well. It's a two way street. I mean, all communication is, um, but you can start to try and frame your responses around yes and rather than yes, but. 
because then you, you're taking in the other person's um, comment or concern or issue or question and acknowledging that and there's this technique in you know counseling called active listening where you reflect back to someone oh yes I, I hear that you're concerned about you know the fact that we're going to demolish a whole city block um, so am I right in saying that you think blah 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 so you're reflecting the question back to someone which means that you're on the same page from the beginning rather than coming from a defensive combative place and so that's very, um, that's a deliberate thing you can do with your language to try and be more constructive and to build bridges between people rather than, um, you know, operating out of silos. But I wonder if I could push you both on that a little bit more because I think um, Diana's question is a really crucial one because what about if we, um, if there was a kind of culture of agreement where we just assumed that every building was a good building um, and, you know, praised one another of course, we can't do that because not every building is a good building and some are actively harmful in terms of how much energy they use and um, embody carbon, blah, 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 blah. You know, there are many ways in which a building can be quote unquote bad. Yes. Um, so, I mean, what, what is the role of critique? Of course, criticism can be both negative and positive. It does not automatically or necessarily negative. Uh, and I totally agree with your point, Rachel, about the kind of bloodlust in architecture and a, um, a kind of critical culture which loves to sink the boot in. Um, but we can't, I would say, argue that we can't go too far in the other direction because some buildings are actually bad and should be called out as such. I totally agree with you. So now have you got something to add to that? No, I agree. I, I don't think critique, and I don't think we were saying that, that it needs to be um, positive or even um, gentle. Mm. I, I think it's really important to discuss qualities of building and um, fit for purposeness of buildings and um, and have those discussions. I mean, your question was about design excellence, and I think it takes a lot of different perspectives and experience and expertise to to tease out whether a project meets a bunch of different criteria in, in excellence. Mm. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's worth having those hard conversations, not actually being too worried about hurting feelings, which is how get, taking it out of personal language really helps if it's measured against the criteria that that project has to meet, those are criteria for excellence. You can say, is, is your decision here meeting this criteria? Are there other ways? That you could have approached it. I'm not sure that the approach you've chosen is the most effective way. Mm. And this is why. I think criticism is one of Naomi and my favourite topics. <laughs> and we've both thought and written a lot about it and we could basically hijack this whole session by continuing to do that. But we might not, Naomi. <laughs> Maybe we'll have another session on criticism because I think there's, and, you know, there's so much to say. And I think the kinds of relationship between communication and criticism are mm. complex and, and really fascinating um but i kind of would i'm quite keen to to given that we've got 25 minutes left to um shift a little bit to some um discussion that might help the audience think about um kind of how to communicate at the kind of personal level and we've got a really good comment here from um, Jessica Hyde, a brief comment about the opportunity of having your voice heard. Jessica, I wonder if you might want to just make your comment to us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so my comment was, um, I think a key part of it is, like I understand about the idea of criticism and think it's valid, but it's also being about giving the opportunity to feel like your voice is valid and that you have, um, that it's worth actually saying something. So i possibly that obviously happens when you're at uni, um, but also in practice, that at a certain point, the culture, if it, do, if it isn't supportive and um, you aren't being given the opportunity to feel like what you're saying is worth saying, at a certain point, it just ruins your confidence and you don't keep going. So, yeah, I don't know. It's not, not so much a question, but just a <laughs> general comment of how you actually combat that. And especially for younger people in the industry, I think it's difficult to come up against um, more senior people and directors and things like that when and feel like you have what you're saying is um, valid. Well, Jessica, I, will, I have to say I was, I was interested in that comment as a way to sort of uh, maybe turn to talk about questions about confidence and questions about tone as well. Um, yeah. 
So, um, you know, lots of people, and I think this can be quite gendered, not always, um, often feel a bit nervous or uncomfortable speaking about themselves. Um, often we're much more comfortable talking about work or, and I know, Sana, this is your, you're very focused on helping people um, work out how to do this. And I wondered if we might talk a little bit about tips for those who do feel nervous or uncomfortable. And often it's just practice, but, but there's some lessons we might take with us as we try and improve. Yes, yes, I love this. I love uh, helping generally younger people in the profession, but not always young, not always female, but various people in the architecture profession who who feel nervous and it might be nervous about um, talking in a meeting or nervous about presenting to a client for the first time, uh, nervous about presenting at a conference. Gosh, of course. So nerves in general, I believe are just part of life. It's not actually something that you ever get over in my experience. Um, and they cover the spectrum, like a huge spectrum from, you know, a, a full on panic attack at one end, debilitating, to maybe slight butterflies in your stomach and you can still function. And I've seen people across that whole spectrum, we all come at it from a very different perspective. So the way nerves affect you are really personal. I think the first thing is to work out how they affect you and why. So the first thing is self-awareness. What is it for me? Do I get a shaky leg? Um, do I get a dry mouth? Uh, do I know that a particular type of forum is going to really make me freak out? And so how might I need to prepare for that? So one, self-awareness, and then two, how do I best prepare for those situations? And what does it mean to me to feel prepared? Do I need to have a script? Fine. Do I need to have notes? Am I much better when I don't over-prepare and just speak from the heart? You know, It's about knowing how best you can handle the things that you know your nerves throw at you. And sometimes drawing on other experiences in your life. So people that might have played sports or captained a team or played music on a stage or done all those different things where you've had to perform or had to deliver in, in the moment. You can draw on some of those memories and experiences to bring with you into your professional life. Mm. Mm. Um, what else? I mean, one of those, you talked a little bit about gendered um, elements of confidence and speaking and I see and tone you mentioned tone Justine so I see a lot of the time tone can actually make you come across as less confident than you are and one of the things I really pick up in people especially women is inflection and that means going up at the ends of every sentence so I've designed a building and I think it's going to meet all of your criteria it makes you sound much less confident than if you, if you were saying, I've designed a building and it meets all of your criteria and I'm going to tell you how. You just keep it on that same level or you go down or you bring other, you know, modulations into that sentence and just keep an eye out for that habit of going up in pitch at the ends of your sentences. So it's a, it's a broad area to practice in that whole thing of getting confident in an arena of public speaking and speaking up. And um, I believe it's kind of a bit of a life work. You just keep learning, keep doing. And I think the question of tone goes to, to um, a discussion Rachel and I had um, just quickly, or Rachel brought up another question mm -hmm. uh, that someone had sent her about the question of tone and confidence and the gendered reception of that and, and um, that some women who present very confidently are then interpreted as being aggressive. Yeah. So, you know, it's you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Rachel, do you have something to say to this? Yeah, sure. I think that um, there's an article that I wrote which will be on the Parlour website shortly and it's about um, the future of education and I interviewed five of the um, female deans running architecture schools around Australia and I did that in March just as the pandemic was hitting. Um, I think Susie's going to be uploading it shortly but I think that's that's really instructive because each of those um, women who spoke to me about their 
leadership style has a very different um, approach and thoughts around um, gender and whether women bring different qualities to you know communications and leadership but I thought it was interesting that Professor Sue Ann Ware at Newcastle said that um, she brings her whole self to work and she's quite a, um, an expressive communicator and she said to me and was happy for me to print in the article that she's been accused of being a hysterical woman because of the way that she is um, so emotional sometimes around issues that she feels passionate about. And she also said that um, she thinks Nancy Pelosi is one of her heroes. And so she doesn't mind the label, you know, hysterical women. So I think that a lot of the issues here come from how you feel about those um, uh, assertions or attacks perhaps that are levied at you. So if they slide off you like water off a duck's back, then it doesn't really matter that someone thinks you're hysterical or too pushy or aggressive or, you know, if you feel confident in your own um, self and the, the work that you're doing and the, the values that you bring to your work, then those um, criticisms or slings and arrows may not hurt so much as if you feel some doubt or if you might have a bit of imposter syndrome or, you know, for various reasons, you don't have confidence in the, the role that you're doing or the position that you're in. So I think that, of course, your response to these um, criticisms is very personal. And a lot of, um, a particularly good way, I guess, of handling that is to think about um, what what you're doing, what why you're in the role that you're in, what brought you there in the first place, what are the values that you wish to espouse, you know, both in your practice and your projects, but also in your relationships with people. And then um, I think that, you know, once you've got a clear sense of that, you, you can then just propagate it. You know, you can stand firm in your style because your style is going to be different from Professor Sue Ann Ware, which is different from Professor Lisa Sharoon. You know, everybody has a different way of being in the world and it's about um, finding confidence around who you are. And I think that um, I wrote a note about this. I wanted to say, I have lots of notes, you know. So one of the things that um, makes me feel confident about appearing at a forum like this is to think about the questions and write some notes and have them in front of me because I know that I'll forget um, you know, in the heat of the discussion or as things are moving quickly. And so this is a way for me to ground myself in what I wanted to say. Um, one of the things that I noted down was that um, confidence comes with age. And you, you, you hear people say that when you're in your 20s and 30s and you don't believe it because at that stage you feel like, you know, you know a lot and you've been around and you've gathered knowledge. But I think that for me in my 40s, I started to feel like, you know what, I've got two decades of stuff under my belt now and I'm quite firm in what I believe and what I think to be valuable and what I'm pre prepared to share. And all of a sudden the criticisms or the doubt that I felt in my 30s just, you know, slipped away and I feel quite... Um, quite okay now about putting myself out into the world and saying this is what I believe and I wouldn't have been able to do this 10 years ago. So of course as you mature, as you get a better sense of yourself, as you gain more experience, that confidence comes. I wondered if we might, um, we've, we've got a really good question from Monica Edwards which maybe we'll come back to but um, uh, Sanaya, you talked a little bit about public speaking, which is great, but what about, let's say, private speaking, as in, you know, if a person is in a negotiation with their boss and feels uncomfortable about saying, I've been doing fantastic work, I really need a pay rise, um, I deserve a pay rise. <laughs> um, what about that, you know, cultivating a tone there, which doesn't, you know, we know that women um, uh, can be perceived as pushy or, you know, you've got to be careful to be seen to be over overvaluing yourself, blah, 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 blah. What's mm. your advice around communication in that context? Oh, <laughs> I relate to this one. Um, a <laughs> couple of things, a couple of approaches. So I would get you to picture the most ambitious person in your office sitting in your place and think about how they talk about themselves and then have a think about what you'd like to say about yourself. Um, I would also, oh, what was I going to say about this? Sometimes, sometimes it helps 
to picture yourself as another person. Or think about a really close friend of yours who you think is amazing at their job and think about how you would pitch that person to their boss for a promotion. That, and that might help you um, just take a little step out of yourself and your shyness or your, um, your feeling that this isn't what nice people, this isn't what nice people do. I shouldn't have to blow my own horn. I shouldn't have to um, tell somebody why, why I'm good at my job, why I deserve this promotion. Again, it's a little bit, it's a little bit harks back to the work, your work speaking for yourself. So in a lot of cases, your hard work doesn't always speak for itself. Your, um, your consistent and excellent work may not always speak for itself. It might get lost in the noise. So I would find ways to demonstrate what you think you've achieved and get, get people around you, get your, your close friends, your close colleagues to help. Get them to help because often they'll see it in you that you know it's difficult for you to see mm. that's i think that's really outstanding advice <laughs> thanks <laughs> we can all we can all use it yeah <laughs> exercise around that i did a course earlier in the year and one of the exercises was to send an email to 10 people that you trust friends and colleagues and ask them what are the three qualities that they most like or admire about you and i did that and it's a surprising way to get um, external perspectives on yourself. And that might be a useful thing to do if you're pitching for a pay rise, because often people see you in a different way to the way that you perceive yourself. And it can be useful to have that sort of 360 view, you know, of your work and your contribution in order to be able to go into that meeting, which can be very nerve wracking to, to make a case. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think the point is super well made because um, it sometimes is the case that a person who's doing a really good job, therefore, is inconspicuous and, in fact, invisible because they're doing such a good job. They're not creating problems. They're just putting their head down and, and doing it. So I guess it's communication in the purest sense, as in, OK, well, this is what I have done. You know, it's, it's in fact, even quite neutral and not a horn blowing exercise. Um, Justine, should we go back to Monica's question or do you want to keep going on the question of advocacy? Um, I think Monica's question is very good and actually relates to it. Um, I'd just say something quickly about the, the confidence question. There's something someone said to me a long time ago. I used to be a terribly nervous speaker. And someone said to me, you know, the audience is really invested in the idea that you know what they're do you're doing. They don't come to this thinking you don't know what you're talking about. They come to this thinking you do. And if you flap around and go, you know, you are, they're invested in believing you until you give them evidence that you don't know what you're talking about because you start flapping. So I just, as a flapper, a continual flapper, I just put that out there. Um, but yes, let's go to Monica. Monica, are you willing to uh, put your question? It's a little while back now. Where are you, Monica? Are you with us? Hello. Hello. Hey, yeah, Mark. happy to. Um, I'm a flapper too, Justine. So I think just keep rolling with it and assume people know what you're talking about. Um, I'm going to use the word that you referenced, hornblower. I was recently on a jury and I felt that a lot of people were just giving me or giving the panel a whole lot of blah about how great they were without necessarily going into explaining why. So I felt I was, uh, adjectives were thrown at me that were around the idea of um, this is special, but I didn't know why it was special. So my question is, how can we better um, explain ourselves as, because um, it was consistent across the profession, how can architects elaborate on the why better? Question. Shall I go, Sinead? Yeah, yeah, go, go. I think that's... So I think um, this is a good point to bring in journalism training. Journalism um, the way that you approach a news story is there are six W's and you have to um, you have to cover each of those in the news story. And if you haven't um, included one of them, the editor will send it back with a lot of red pen through it and say, try better. So the six W's are who, what, where, when, where, how and why. And I think that all of the, the five W's help to explain the why because um, the context of who you're doing it for, where, you, where you're creating the project, um, when in time, you know, what are the, um, 
the market or environmental or contextual um, drivers that are informing your response, um, the how, all of these things will help you explain your why. So you can come at that, um, that question of how to drill down into projects or to give information uh, to people who aren't familiar with what it is you're trying to talk about by going back to those very simple journalistic what are the six W's. So I advise my clients to write down the answers to each of those things and I, I do this with my awards workshop and then once you've got those six things on a page probably two or three of them will leap out at you as being the most important things, the themes that were um, so uh, uh, important around driving your response or that uh, set the design intent that then was carried through the project. So those are the things that um, you'll highlight first. And so in journalism, we try and write a lead and a lead is a 25 word sentence that introduces the story. And you might have two or three of those W's in the lead, the what and the where and the how, for example, and then you address the other three subsequently in the story. And another thing that we do in writing journalism stories is we put all of the really important stuff at the top of an inverted pyramid and the least important details at the bottom because the editor is going to cut from the bottom. So you want to make sure that your important tasks, uh, sorry, important tips and information are right at the top so they don't get cut out of the story. And th this, um, you know, it's a fairly simplistic way of presenting information, but it's worked for newspapers for 150 years and it continues to work, you know, even with the transition to social media. And I think that it's a useful framework for um, architects to be able to write about their work, especially when architects, um, you know, they, they tend to have a preference for visual communications and to struggle with writing. So having systems and processes like this that, um, you know, a template that makes it easy for you to sit down and start putting words on a page, I think can be really helpful if there's some reluctance around doing that. I'm a big fan of examples. I'm a really big fan of examples. You say your work's amazing, exemplary, um, it's achieved all these things. Show me how. Who says it has? Is, it a, is there a quote? Is there a testimonial? Is there um, a, enough detail for me to be convinced. So I think examples are really helpful. Mm. Or also another way of phrasing that would be to say evidence, you know, you're making yes. claims. So where's your evidence for your Correct. claim? Um, mm. it, which then makes um, a claim an argument rather than an opinion. Uh -huh. But I wonder whether we could possibly go to Jenny Officer who has an excellent question about tone. Jenny. Sorry, I'm just unmuting myself. Yeah, I'm just really interested in tone as it relates to um, inequities that you see in systems, in processes, in workplaces, unfairness and inequity. I've certainly spoken up before and been told that it didn't do me any favours, uh, particularly in things like competitions, by speaking up against inequitable processes. And I always wonder whether it's content, because I strongly believe in speaking up where you see these things happening or whether it was just a matter of tone. I'd be really interested in hearing people's thoughts on that. I think that tone um, is so important. And I saw an example of, um, I thought that someone struck the wrong tone this week when they were trying to provide some criticism. So um, a group that I was in, someone posted uh, a photo that said, look at this, isn't this a great initiative? Um, someone else wrote back and said, yes, it's fantastic. We should all be doing that. A third person chimed in and said, I don't want to be a negative Nancy, but, and then laid out their, um, their concerns or objections around the thing. And then a fourth person chimed in and said, um, I, I hear your concerns and we can certainly address those going forward. And we should certainly be prioritising the things that you've listed. And to me, that was a really um, succinct example of how Starting off by saying, I don't want to be a negative Nancy, but is a really, it gets people's guard up even before you get the point, get to the point that you want to make. And the point that that person was making was really useful. And it was, um, it was definitely called for, but I feel like um, just by framing it in that way, it, um, it, it made it difficult for people to hear it. So I certainly uh, think what you said, Jenny, about 
it was it the content or was it the tone? And for me, um, tone needs to inform all of your communications um, and and be very carefully considered. And so one of the things that I do with my clients is we come up with what I call a practice tone of voice. And so we use um, a sheet of values and I ask the clients to highlight the values that they, um, they wish to um, embody in their work and, and you know, the, the qualities that they bring to work that um, are personal qualities which can be extrapolated across practice. And to then frame all of their communications by referring constantly back to that um, that practice tone of voice that we've identified. So do you want your practice or your architecture to be, um, you know, hectoring and critical and sniping and um, uh, not constructive? Or do you want to be able to present your information in a way that people can easily hear and consider and take on? So there's certainly ways that um, you could fall either side of that line and you have to be very deliberate about it and this is one of the things that um, one of the challenges I guess for architects who haven't tended to um, spend a lot of time finessing their communications as Sanea was saying you know she does exercises with people and workshops you know this stuff is a practice it takes time it takes effort and you have to be very intentional about wanting to go down a certain path. And I think that um, architects have tended to, um, as I said earlier, speak to each other. And then they try and use those same words and phrases when they're talking to people who don't necessarily have the same knowledge of design and the profession. And it comes across as arrogant, even if people don't mean for it to. So that's why I always say, I want you to think about your audience from the get-go because if your audience isn't already on the same page in terms of understanding what you're talking about then you might need to adopt a more conciliatory or collegiate tone in order to bring them up to speed so that then you can have the conversation mm. look we have got two minutes left um Sanaya, do you want to have the last word on the question of tone yes yes because i um i love this question I think it's really important to be honest in your emotion. So Jenny, you mentioned being, you know, you were critical, you might have been angry at, at what something, whatever was going on in this process. And I think it's really important um, not to pretend not to be. I think when you see something that you are um, really passionate about, that makes you furious, that makes you um, whatever emotion, whatever strong emotion, that's really valid and that's really important to be heard. The question I would put to it was, would be, what intent do you want your message to have? And if you, if you want people to respond to it and go, um, take it on board, um, if you want people to be receptive to it, if you want people to just notice you, then sometimes maybe, maybe a really vocal and strident um, argument needs to be put. Maybe it needs to be in strong language. Maybe it needs to be shouted. But I just think, yeah, think about people that you like to listen to, people that you, um, whose advice you take on board and what, what makes you receptive to an opposing view. That's a big question, actually. That's a great question. <laughs> I'm going to write that down. <laughs> um, crikey, we could keep going forever. And in fact, this was fabulous. Question, a whole new thread come from Kim Baisley in the chat about body language. Um, and there were some excellent questions from Kimberly Huey that we didn't get to, sorry, Kimberly. Um, but we've got to wrap it up because we're out of time. So Justine, what's happening next week? Uh, next week we have uh, Natalie Galea talking about sponsorship. This came up in the session last week, not, not sponsorship as in raising money, sponsorship as in supporting um, others. And uh, Nat is, uh, will, has a, done a lot of work on this uh, based in her PhD, but now um, in acting sponsorship programs within mostly construction industries, but she is a fabulous speaker and I think will be very, very informative. It feels to me there's so much that's come out of this chat today. I feel like there's a whole lot of other sessions that might um, come out of that. Um, Cara is advocating for something, something on criticism and, and 
which I think Naomi and I will be totally up for. Um, uh, I think the questions around tone and negotiation are very uh, big and interesting ones. And I'm certainly keen to do a session on negotiation sometime soon too. Um, and, you know, when, when do you, I think this is an issue all the time in terms of gender equity. Um, when, do, when are you angry? And when do you, you know, be as nice as pie to get that message home, even though you're really furious. Um, so I think it's, a, you know, there's a really interesting question there. Um, there's so much great stuff in the chat, Naomi. Mm, I know, this has been a corker. Well, we'll have to have you back, Rachel and Salaya. It's been really fantastic. Thank you. You've been so articulate and absolute models of excellent communication. So thank you very much. I think we usually do a virtual clap. Let's do a virtual clap, everybody. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. It has. Thank you for inviting us. <laughs>